Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. You hit the spot. The place for the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Put your thinking caps on because the conversation starts now. Podcast, the place where the conversations are pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Today we are going to Canada. We are going to be visiting with Pearl Gregor. Pearl has dedicated her life to dreams. Uh, I'm a big dreamer, so I have a lot of questions about the connection with dreams, our subconscious mind. She holds dream circles, and she's the author of a great book. Let's welcome her to the show. How are you, Pearl? I'm just wonderful. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm excited to talk to you about this because I'm a big dreamer. Tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Well, I show up as a dream worker now. I spent many years as a depressed person, and that's how I got into dreams. I, I eventually figured out from a book that I could ask for a dream. And so I asked for a dream, and I got a deep and profound dream. I had no idea what it meant. I knew nothing about dreams. I just knew I had asked for a dream. So that's that's how I've done my life since I that happened when I was 43 years old in 1988. Now, let me ask a question, um, just for clarity and to frame this. Do you have a uh, deep religious faith or uh, spiritual faith? I certainly did. I was born and raised a Roman Catholic. Okay. Um, and I, my parents were Roman Catholic, were Roman Catholic back to the time of Luther. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> very long. It's a very long history. Two so, of my parents were nuns. Oh, two of your, your my father's sisters, my aunts. Wow. How was that having nuns uh, for aunts? You know, because aunts are very special people. They're not the sister. They're not the mother. They're not the friend. They're like a combination of all of them. But were they were they strict? Were they great confidants? Did you find great were, comfort in them? I didn't know them very well. They lived. Uh, we lived in the no part of northern Alberta. Me and my, well, I grew up in northern Alberta, so there was not a lot of places to go. You had it was a long trip to Edmonton. I I never saw Edmonton until I was fourteen years old. So I didn't know my aunts very well. They lived quite far away. They ended up in Winnipeg, and and the, the younger one ended up in Kingston. But they were fun-loving people. Whenever they came to the house, they were more fun than many people. Oh, I always okay. figured nuns got a bad rap because my two aunties were wonderful women. I bet, I bet, I bet. So tell us a little bit about dreams. About dreams? Well, dreams are a crack into your psyche. They're a part of your underworld. Every last single person dreams, and we dream a lot. We need deep sleep to dream. We don't dream well if we're on medication, but we, we have a lot of dreams in our lifetime. Many people don't pay much attention. Our dreams come from our psyche. It's come our, from our unconscious. I follow the work of Carl Jung quite closely. So that I, I and I'm not, a, I'm not a psychoanalyst. I have, all I've learned is what I've learned through experience and through my own reading. Well, you know, a lot of times people overthink dreams. They really do, and they get caught up in them, and then sometimes they underestimate them. How do you, you you lead credence to a dream? Sometimes I'll be thinking about something, and it just bombards my dream. Or I'll wake up from a dream, and then go back to sleep, and go back to that dream. What is that about? Well, that's because you're, you're, you, you are remembering your dream. And you're supposed to remember your dream. And so your dream returns to make sure that you're remembering it. That's what that's about, near as I can tell. But if you have a, a dream about what happened during your day, it simply means your psyche is using what happened during the day because you're going to remember that. And it doesn't mean that it's about that. It just means the dream is using that as a setting for what it really wants to tell you. Because it doesn't tell you anything in literal terms. It speaks to you in symbols. Okay. So speak, so something it speaks to you in, sim in symbols and metaphors. In metaphors at all times. Yeah. Symbols and metaphors. Okay. So how do great people like you learn to interpret others' dreams? 
Well, you learn to ask a lot of questions of other people. If you tell me a dream, I'm not going to tell you what it means because I do not know. You are the only one. You're the, you are the expert in your field. You may not know it, but I can ask you a lot of questions and I spend my days learning the questions I need to ask from people. I ask them, what does that mean? What do you think it could mean? What does it mean to you that that happened yesterday? How did you feel when you had the dream? How did you feel when you woke up from the dream? All kinds of different questions. What does that chair mean in real life? What, is, what does a cat mean to you? And I have read many, many books about it. So you said to ask a lot of uh, questions, to be very inquisitive, and then try to make sense of it. You know, people say, oh, I had a picture. Of, I mean, I had a dream of a black cat. And no, uh, you, again, what does symbolism of the cat mean to you? What does the color black mean to you? Where were you located at the time? Does it, you know, does it have any relationship to what you might be going through? I'll give an example. I was nervous. I had a dream that one of my family members and I went on vacation and they drowned. And I was like, wow. Oh my God, I was scared to go on vacation because I was like, oh, this, this person is going to drown. We can't go in the water and we're going to a tropical place. But they were going through something else. And so that drowning was a symbol of they were in over their head. They, exactly. were, they were in something that was over their head and they were submerged in it. Right. And, but if they continued to, you know, kind of fight through it and struggle that they would emerge. Well, I tell you, that was a relief. It was really, exactly. relieving. but you have to have someone there that, you know, it's like a psychologist. You need to have somebody on the side that can really separate the fact from the fiction because you get caught up in dreams. And you, and you learn a lot about mythology when you study dream work, because mm -hmm. very often there's, there's a mythological perspective coming through in your dream. My dreams were about Inanna. If you're familiar with the goddess Inanna. No, or I'm the, not. Tell me about it. Well, the goddess Inanna was the mother of all goddesses, and she was she was um, she's the goddess of wisdom. She is a deep, pr profound goddess. She comes to people in wisdom dreams to, to women, especially these days. The feminine is emerging if you're watching your dreams and you're watching the world, and the feminine is coming into its own finally. It's been scorched and burned and left behind for decades and centuries out of mind. But it, my dream was about Anana and the underworld. And I embarked on the underworld where she took a trip into the underworld and she there and she was hung, stripped and hung from a pig. And she changed seven, she had to go through seven gates to get to, to her, her sister, Ereskigal. And she finally, when she finally found her sister, her, her shadow sister, her shadow sister had her killed. And that's not, it's not literal. It's, it's a metaphor for, for changing your identity. So she had to go through seven different changes in identity. I went through seven major changes in, in who I really was. In the, in those, I was in seven years in this descent to the underworld. And that's where I met the goddess Inanna. Wow. Now you say the underworld. The underworld, which is, well, often Christians, People think that's Hades, or, or which people call hell. There's no such place as hell. There's no such place as the underworld. But we've got lots of Dan Dante's Divine Comedy is about living in the underworld. It's where we go through a lot of identity uh, identity changes. It happens for many women in their midlife. I came into midlife as a depressed person. I was under psychiatric care, and I was hearing voices. So that's what led me into the desperate need for to learn how to dream to remember my dreams and i read a book about it that i've got a book in the mail from a, a, a relative of mine who told me well you're getting into the occult so we think because i was meditating a great deal i had learned meditation and i had changed my life a lot just for meditation i got very ill i ended up in the hospital because i was unloading so much toxicity during those those times that was in August of 1988. Then I go, she, she sent me this box of books, which were about spirituality. But what she didn't realize was the box of books had one about recalling dreams. It's called A Christian Approach to Dream Work. Mm. And it's a very, I would, I would not 
I recommend it. It's a very narrow book now. I, I don't believe that Christianity is the only religion that, that's around. I believe that there's many great religions and there's, they're equal. It doesn't matter which God you, you name them, they're all the same God. Okay. And I, that, that, that comes from uh, a book called uh, the, Goddess Initiation of, the Goddess Initiation of Women. Mm. That's by Sylvia Pereira. And she, she's dissected Anana, the story of Anana, from a psychological perspective. Okay. So I, I picked up that book and I read that in 1988. I forgot about it until I went to write my own books. And then I began to read that book again. So what do you say to the person that is fearful and says, you know what? Okay, I hear what she's saying. She went through a lot. You've peeled back a lot of layers. You know, you said that you were under doctor's care. You were very stressed out. You were on medication. You were in the underworld. What if somebody, and I say this with love, what if somebody says, you know, Pearl was just tripping. <laughs> she was, you know, I, she, I don't know where she was. She was on a psychedelic something. What do you say to that person? How did you really realize that this was factual? How did I realize it was factual? Because the night that I had the actual miracle in my life, I was meditating with two other women. And it came through to me from my own inner voice, what had happened to me as a pre-verbal child. I had been molested. I, I learned the name of the man because I had forgotten all about this. I was less than two years old. You have no language to explain it. All I know is I was depressed from the age of nine until 43. And when I sat in that meditation and I learned all of that stuff, I, was, I knew something happened to me that night. My menstrual cycle went to normal. I had never in all those years had a normal, regular cycle. And suddenly my menstrual cycle went to 28 days and it stayed at 28 days till I was menopausal. Wow. So I, I knew I anybody who wanted, and I didn't, too many people don't argue with you because they could tell it was a genuine experience. And it took, it wasn't, wasn't until 2018 that I wrote my books. That was 30 years later before I finally got the courage to write the books because you're you're stripping your whole life and putting it out for people to read about. Oh yeah, you're becoming very vulnerable. You're Are you married? Vulnerable. Are you married? Do you have children? I have three children. My husband passed away 23 years ago. He was 56 years old. Oh, bless his heart. Yes. Now, were, was he around to see this metamorphosis, to see you turn from a caterpillar into a butterfly? He did. He watched the whole event. He was an amazing man. Without him, I'd have never survived. I know that. Well, that is so wonderful that you had someone that had the tenacity to stick by you because a lot of people would just said, you know what, forget this noise. I'm out of here. You know, my exactly. wife is doing some things and she's changing and, you know, it, it was, it's very difficult. Now, in conjunction to this, are you still very religious? I'm deeply spiritual. I wouldn't say I'm religious anymore. I believe in, a, in, a, in God. I believe that God is with me and I am one with God. That's the deepest spirituality I can think of, that I am one with the entire universe. Okay. I'm one with nature. I'm one with you. I'm one with everybody on the planet. Okay. That's beautiful. So tell me, what is uh, the significance of that big cobra sitting in the chair? That cobra came home to me from a, 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 an antique store. The, uh, my husband and I were coming back from uh, my youngest brother's funeral in 1997. And it was very close to Christmas. And I, we stopped at an antique store because I, I loved antiques in those days. I was always buying an antique of some kind. I saw this Sophia. I call her Sophia, the goddess of wisdom. Mm. And anyway, I was in this antique store and I saw this statue, I call her. And I asked the lady how much. And she said, oh, just take her. Just get her out of here. I hate her. I brought her home with me and she's sat here ever since. Wow. She's my, you'll see that she's on the front page of my, of everything that I, I write and everything that I do. She's my, my uh, symbol of my dream work and the symbol of the wisdom of Sophia. Okay. Because some people would be nervous about that. You know, they have a. Absolutely. A I had one lady, one client, who, one client who came to my house and she, she didn't even see that. It was sitting right on the hearth in front of the fireplace. And she had a, had a dream and I was asking her questions and she was avoiding answering the real question, which was clearly a deeply Christian 
approach to this to this dream and she was she was looking at it from a in rose colored glasses and i was trying to get her to see she couldn't see her i asked her what was sitting in front of the hearth and she said there's nothing there pearl i said have another look it took me three times before she looked and said oh i see a snake i hate snakes I said to her, do you understand the symbolism of snakes? No, she had. She just knew that, that the snake was in the Garden of Eden and was tempting Eve. I said, that's, I'm sorry, but that's not true. The snake is actually a symbol of, the, of Sophia, and she's the wisdom. She is, she is the inventor of the world. She's in all of these great things. And, it, and when the snake shows up in a dream, you know you are ready to be healed. A snake or a dog. A snake or a dog? Okay. That comes from from the uh, I'm I'm not going to remember the name of the of the temple, but there's a great temple where the people went to pray for, and when they they were held in the outer portico of this temple, the outer porch, and they couldn't go inside until they had a dream about either a snake or a dog. Then they oh. then they, the priests knew they were ready for healing and they could come inside. Wow. So, so we know that snakes are very, very important in dream work. Okay, because a lot of people say, I dreamed of a snake and, you know, they go nuts. I they know. Feel that they feel that something is, is wrong. I uh, know. Symbolism, uh, um, dreams have numbers as well. Tell us about how numerology and dreams coincide. Well, they coincide very well. Unfortunately, I am not an expert in numerology. I know that the number seven is a sacred number. I know that 12 is, an, is a completion number because there's 12 hours in a, in a cycle or 24 hours in a cycle. I do not know much about other dreams. I'm not familiar with the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people use the Enneagram as a, a spiritual tool to work with. That's not something I've ever done much with. I'm more into Carl Jung than anything else. Okay. So uh, tell us a little bit about your books and what are inside the pages of your publications. Well, my books are about my dream world and about the dream work. I was doing meditation and, and journaling. I journaled everything in the early years. I journaled absolutely everything because writing is the way to, to get to the truth of what's going on within you. So I often wrote late into the night. I wrote about what was happening to me, what everything. I wrote it in journals. And so when I decided, in, I had I had my inner voice kept telling me, it told me in 1993, I was driving along the road to a workshop. I was a consultant in those years. And I was driving to do a workshop in a, a city 200 miles from home. And I was on the highway when suddenly a voice spoke to me out of the back seat of my car. It said, write dreams along the way. And I thought, Who? there's nobody in the car. I looked, I stopped, I looked around, there's nobody there. I drove away. <laughs> so, and the voice Stay said, in the car with me, I know. Exactly. Write dreams along the way. And I kept on driving. So he said it louder. Write dreams along the way. Finally, I stopped. I got out of my car. I walked around twice. I got back in, started to drive again. And the voice said, I said, write dreams along the way. I said, all right, already. And that's when I started to write everything that happened to me in those years. And it wasn't that was in 1993. It was in 2014. I had strokes. And when I came out of those strokes, I said to myself, it's time to start writing. I, I, I left my home in, in January 7th or whatever, and I went to Victoria, B.C. And I had a place to live in down there. And I took my writing tools with me, my computer, and I decided I will write a book about these. I will write dreams along the way. I had already been studying and doing my, my workshops under dreams along the way. I had written a, my dissertation. I studied for my dissertation in from 2005 to 2008. I started that when I was 60 years old. And so I, I had learned writing and I called my dissertation the apple and the talking snake, which is symbol, symbols for the, the snake who talked to Eve in the garden. Wow. And that's a kind of a long story that I won't tell you tonight. However, the journaling led to the, the book writing, and I started to write my books in Victoria. I wrote one book that winter. It took till 2018 for me to find an editor and a structural editor, and those were fines. They're, they're synchronous fines. You don't find an editor just on the street corner somewhere, but I did. I found it through a, 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 an ad somebody made, not for an editor, 
but I phoned a lady who was studying in Psyche Salon and her name was, or is, and campaign is her name. And I found her on a, on a, in a, in a talk on a website. And so she edited my work for me. And I was, when I was ready to start publishing, I knew nothing about the world of publication, absolutely nothing. And I put an, Anne put an ad in the paper asking for a structural editor. And this man, finally, he phoned me twice. He sent me several letters. I got letters from 35 people offering to edit my books. But I, I chose the guy who lived eight blocks away from me because he phoned me twice and said, are you ready to choose somebody? I said, yes, I am. I'll, I'll make a choice as soon as I decide. I was waiting for a, a message to tell me which one to, to decide on. So he said, well, I live only eight blocks away. So I said, where do you live? Can we meet for coffee? We went for coffee. I hired him on the spot. Wow. That's was, amazing how things, again, how things manifest. Now, I'm a manifester and I get downloads. Right. Um, and I have a lot of dreams. I, exactly. said, I said, baby, do you dream? He said, I don't dream a lot. I think he dreams, but he doesn't recall them or they're not. Mine speak to me as, again, like that person spoke to you in the back of the car. It gives me clear ideas. It gives me visuals. It gives me locations. It gives me timelines. Is that, is it more than just a dream? Am I connecting to a spiritual realm? I'm right. not sure. Now, I'm a very religious person. You know, I believe in Jesus Christ. I don't have any problem saying his name. Um, I, I live that life, but I'm very spiritual too. I'm aware of energies. I'm aware, I'm visited by spirits a lot in right. my life. You know, I can talk to them just like I'm talking to you. And there's dialogue back and forth. But is this, do maybe I have an uh, undiscovered gift, maybe? Well, you have a gift. Most people have the gift, but they don't use the gift. Mm -hmm. I agree. Everybody dreams, but many people just think about the numbers of people who, who just say, it's a weird thing that happened. I had a weirdest dream last night. They don't even know what weird means. It means wise. It does. It does. I know my, my, one of my coaches, she has a group on uh, LinkedIn called the weird ones. And the word weird has really gotten a bad rap, but it really means wise. It that means you're wise. Very, yeah. You're very unique. You're very special. You're very different. So the Bible has about. quite a few dreams in it, but everybody seems to have forgotten that. Right. Because the Christian world outlawed dreaming for quite a number of centuries. You weren't, you were told that dreaming was evil. And that that was done away with in the 40s when and they decided that it wasn't evil and it had never been evil. Of course, it wasn't evil. We've decided a lot of things are kind of evil in today's world. And it's nonsense because God created nothing that was e e evil. Well, I mean, you know, you look at the Bible and how many times it's been translated and then, you know, and then interpreted. You know, if you just look, we wouldn't have all these different religions. It's different if you speak a different language or a different uh, uh, you're in a different country, but you have 15 different sects of Christianity. Exactly. What, you know, what does that mean? So I, you know, I get that. And what I don't like uh, about people using the Bible to whip you, like they'll bless you out. Someone will get annoyed with you and they say, well, God bless you. Well, you know, you've just been cussed out in a holy kind of way. <laughs> I always say thank you when somebody says God bless you because they, I don't I don't care if it's sarcastic or not because I'm just it's thank you. Exactly, exactly. So tell us a little bit about your dream circles and your your group. I I have dream circles. We started several people were reading my book and I was doing a, a workshop. It started with COVID and I was doing a, a workshop every Wednesday night. With a, with a woman named Beth McCann. And she was working on her book, uh, which is about Reiki and about yoga and dreams. And so we were doing a, a, a workshop every night together, every, every like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, partly yoga, partly dream work. And when we were, it was about the end of the, the first winter, we started in the winter of night of 2000 and 20, to 2020. We started in March or sometime. And several of the women were reading my books and they decided that they wanted to ask me questions about the books. And so if we had a dream circle, they could read and ask me questions and I would answer their questions. So we started our dream circles. 
And then I read a, a Gene Houston's book uh, called uh, the, one the One Millionth Circle, I think it's called. And I, I realized that circles of women are very, very powerful. Yes, it is. The circles, we always think in spirals. Women do think in spirals. Everybody says, think logically. We're thinking logically. We just think in circles. Mm -hmm. A very it. powerful way to actually work is to work in circles. Huh. And do so, a, Do you have a copy of one of your books there? so we can? I have a copy right here. Okay. This is the first one. It's called I, the Woman Planted the Tree. Oh, let me get a, a close, hold that up for us. Say this, I, uh, I, the woman. Planted the tree. I, the woman, planted the tree. Now you can purchase that on Amazon, correct? Yes, you can. I have two more. The second one, they're, they're, in a, they're in a series. The second one is called Authoring Self. That's a beautiful cover. Yes, I designed that cover myself. I'm proud of that cover. I did it in an art session one day in Connecticut. I was with a group of women down there. This is called The Cauldron of the Feminine. Oh. And all of these books give us ways to understand and interpret dreams? They all, there's not a recipe in here. There's a lot of dreams. There's 400 dreams in these books. Wow. And, be, and every one of them has my interpretation of it. Or, and I did a lot of reading in those days. Some of them are symbols that I learned through through reading because there's a lot of books on this. Ma Marion Woodman is one of the foremost. She died a couple of years back when she was in her late 90s. But she has written, she wrote a great deal about women's women's mysteries mm -hmm. and, and becoming a, a, an authentic person was her big claim to fame. She's a Jungian analyst. She, she learned about, she, one of her books is called Leaving My Father's House. When she learned she had to grow up, she couldn't depend on her dad or her or God. She had to learn to depend on herself. And that she was a fully formed human being. She was deeply spiritual. No problem with talking about Jesus or anything else. But she was she was convinced that she had a lot of insight into symbolism. And she did. And I learned a lot from reading her work. So how does this guide us? How do we take this information, even though it's metaphors? Um, do we do it to help us heal? You use yours for healing. Do we use ours for information, for foresight? Do we use it for protection? I know each dream is going to be very specific, but how do we use these as tools and not be afraid of what our subconscious mind brings forth while we sleep? Well, I can't imagine being afraid of myself. And myself includes my subconscious mind, my my unconscious and my personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with the Akashic Records. Yep, I am. Okay, so I had an Akashic Records reading done a few years ago, and I, I learned a whole lot about myself and my ancestors and where I lived and how I lived in the past. We have, we're, we're, there's a lot of people doing a lot of ancestral work as well through right. dream work. And dreams are, can be about absolutely anything. They can tell you how to garden. They can tell you what to plant or when to plant it. Mm. And you can use them. I don't, I don't believe that, that they're prophetic. I believe that we have to make our own minds up. Nobody's going to tell us what's going to happen in the future. A lot of people want their dreams to be about what's going to happen. Stop worrying about the future. Concern yourself with now. Exactly. And the, and because the gift is the present. The gift is the present. It's now. Mm -hmm. And it will tell no, you. Okay, but and I understand what you're saying, how you know, don't use it as a predictor of the future, but we also use it as a template from the past because that epigenetics, that intergenerational trauma, you know, how does that fit into it? Well, it can tell you, your dreams can tell you what did happen to you in the past. And it can tell you what your ancestors are, how you need to learn and what you need to learn about. I, I can't quote as many dreams as I'd like to, because I, I don't know which one you'd like to know about. But even the first dream that I had, it was very difficult for me to figure out what it meant because it was in an elevator and it fell. And the elevator fell and it fell and it fell. And I kept praying, Jesus, make it safe all the way down and it fell I don't know how far a lot of times well I over the course of my life I had a lot of dreams where I'm I'm falling or 
I have a dream that I'm in a maze. And I go around and around. I know I had a dream that uh, I was in a hospital for somebody. And I couldn't find the exit. Oh, my, my Lord. When I woke up, I was exhausted. <laughs> I was. I was like, I was looking for this exit. And I think I, I felt like I was asleep for two hours, just going around and around in a circle. You know, is that because I'm confused? I'm dazed? I'm looking for an answer? Or just that's just how it goes? That's just probably you are looking for an answer and you're going in circles looking for an answer. Mm. When, if you look at the day's events or the last month preceding that dream, where were you going in circles? What, what were you looking for? What were you hoping to find? Mm. What were you working on? Right. What right. was happening in your everyday life or what had happened to you five years ago where you went in a circle? Okay. So that, Okay, so that's that was it. But I'm telling you, I was so glad when I woke up. <laughs> I can't tell you how glad I was when I woke up because I fell in my dreams from the time I was nine years old till I found out what that means. Wow. I was always chased by a man with a scarred face. That was simply telling me when I learned about what dreams mean, it was simply telling me that I had a deep scar within myself. Mm. And once I, if I could learn what that scar was there for, it was, a, it, you know, that Rumi says, the light, the light shine where the light shine. The scar is where the light shines through. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't hear. I didn't know what Rumi was about then. Yeah, Rumi. But been... now I have a clue that Rumi had a great deal of wisdom about him, and he could make simple statements turn into real life events. That scarred man turned out that the scar was. was I could have healed years before if I were to learn anything about dream work. I well, you know, as I always say, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Exactly. You have, to go, you have to go through this journey. You have to go through these transitions. You have to go through, you know, the pain and the sorrow sometimes because you are the one that is going to provide the testimony. You are going to be the, the proof as to what happened because you exactly. lived that experience. Well, I would say that what happened for me was a pure out miracle. I can't think of it as any other way. Well, that is absolutely amazing. So let's ask some fun questions about you, Miss Pearl. <laughs> What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Chocolate. Chocolate, why? Because I love chocolate in any form. It doesn't matter if it's cocoa or what it is. It's cake. It doesn't matter if it's chocolate. It's good. It's good. All right. If you were in a kitchen appliance, what appliance would you be? I'd probably be a, a blender. I get a lot of people that want to be a blender. I asked my doctor today because it's a new doctor. So I wanted to get into his psyche. I said, if you were an appliance, what would you be? He said, a can opener. I had never heard anybody say a can opener. <laughs> but that's good to know. That's good to know that he's open. If you had three magical wishes, what would they be? If I could wish for magic, I would heal my granddaughter. I would heal anybody who came to me. That would be my second wish. My third wish would be to heal the planet. That everybody would understand that the planet is in deep deprivation shape. We have done, we have wasted so much of our good resources. We're so mean to the universe, it's unbelievable. And I would love to people to wake up and realize how important the nature is. It's equal to us. Well, we're mean to one another. Forget the mm -hmm. outside planet. We don't even have decent conversations. And let's take it a little further among family members. People hold animosity. Uh, it's that underlying message. You know, it's what people don't say. You know, it's how they react. So I'm telling you, Brains, pay close attention to how people treat you. You know, right. they may be a really good friend, someone that you've known forever and that you've trusted, but they could be that snake in the grass. They could be. You know, they could not uh, necessarily want your best intention. Uh, so, so we have to be very careful that we're not projecting ourselves onto them, that we are wanting the best for ourselves and as opposed to worrying that the other guy doesn't want the best for us. Right. Why do we want the best for ourselves? Exactly, exactly. And expectations of others. You know, you put people on pedestals, well, I never thought in a million years, and this was my best friend, or this was my husband, or this was this, or this was that. Well, you know what? 
it is what it is and you don't know what you don't know. If you were a car, what kind of car would you be, Pearl? I'd be a Volvo. Ooh. That, well, Volvos last forever. They're like, mm -hmm. they're like mini tanks. <laughs> I had a friend, she had 300,000 miles on her Volvo. 300,000. Well, I could outdo that with the Volkswagen I used to have. My daughter finally sold it for $2,500 when it had 800,000 miles on it. Wow. And it was still running? It was still running. In fact, I still see it around. Well, no, I haven't seen it for a few years, but she sold it in 2002. She was married in 2000 and she sold the, the old Volkswagen in 2002. And I saw it in Sherwood Park, which is 18 miles from me, several times later. Wow. I so that was wow. probably a million miles. When I bought it, the guy said, this will last you a million miles. I said, I don't believe you, but I believed him when it did last that long. That's incredible. That's incredible. And finally, Pearl, what do you want your legacy to be? I'd like to somebody to just say she was a wise dream worker. That's amazing. Thank you so much for being here on the edge. Please tell my brains how to get in contact with you and how they can purchase a copy of one of those amazing books. They can go to, to amazon.ca or amazon.com. Simply type in my name and the books will come up. My name is Pearl Gregor, or you can go to my website, which is www.dreamsalongtheway.com and you will find my books there. You can order them through the website because it'll take you straight to Amazon. You can join a dream circle there. You can simply uh, write me a question on, because it comes up and asks you to subscribe. I do not send out a million, a million messages to you. You'll get three or four messages a year. Usually whenever I start a new dream circle, I send out a, a MailChimp to everybody and I put it on my website. Right. So what was your other question? How to contact me? Okay, my, my email is pecgregor at gmail.com. And we're going to put all of this information, Brains, at the back of the interview because I don't want you to miss an opportunity to have your dreams come true. But also know that nothing comes to a sleeper but a dream. Wake up, get woke. It's time. It won't. Thank you so exactly. much, Pearl. You are the best. Brains, go in and love, like, share, and subscribe right here. Love, mm -hmm. like, share, and subscribe on the edge. And we wish you the best. And thank you so much for taking the time to dedicate uh, to each one of us how to interpret something that has always been a great mystery. You're the best, Pearl. Thank you very much, April. All right. Bye, Brains. Bye-bye.